Hi there, this is uh, Koiro and this is my first video in my uh, power supply series and I'm going to talk about these power supplies, the white ones and yeah, I'm going to go into real deep detail and I'm not sure if every one of you will uh, follow this through but I do feel a need to say what I have to say in the order that I say it. There is no quick fixes to understanding how complicated and integral the power supply situation on the C64 are. So this episode I will start with the internals of the C64 itself because it's a lot of power issues and you need to know what the power is for. Uh, is for before you make a good power supply so that's why I start with the internals but also in this episode I will at least make the tools I need to get a good measurement on um, the C64 and for that I will use my uh, power supply tester that I made in another video and that will be my link into measuring what the power situation into the C64 really are and what you can get away with and what is smart and what is not. So I won't keep you any longer but this will be the first part in I think a three episode series. Maybe we will reach it in two but I do think it will be a three episode series. So. Let's jump into the theory, shall we? Ah, sorry to bother you, but my um, stupid and sometimes evil twin brother forgot to um, mention a, a very important thing regarding the power supplies and the C64s. And that is that the power consumption on a modern C64C, a bread bin and everything in between, is not the same. They're using less and less ships, of course, they draw less and less power. And they also changed the process to um, pure CMOS process on the new ones, the 85 series of chips. And they are drawing much, much less power. They also taken away the 12 volts and then done 9 volts. So everything is pointing towards that the newer machines are drawing much less power than the old ones. So when we are doing measurement, we can't measure just on one C64. We have to measure at least on one old and one new. And we also have to take into consideration that people are plugging in things in all these holes. So we will test with a device in the cassette port, a device in the user port and the cartridge to see if the power draw increases much and what it has to see for the total power draw. So. No, it's over to the real boring theory. Yes, and before the theory, I do have some uh, really good power jokes for you. And this is about the C64 power struggle, of course. And the jokes are as follows. Hope that this will energize you or spark some interest until the ampere strikes back. Sorry, <laughs> this is the last of my uh, power jokes. You know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I can assure you, everything but the last line is viewer suggestions, so don't blame me. Yeah, this is an old slide from another video, and this was when I uh, did some fault finding on a power switch. But also in this video, we did have an yeah important fact, and that is that on some C64, it stated that power is taken in on both pin 4 and 5 but what we discovered is that the old power supply had the power in on 5 and the new one had it on pin 4. So if you take a really old C64 and you take a white modern power brick 
you won't be able to power your C64 because this is not connected. And this is something that is really un, yeah, what should I say, under communicated. And it might be because it might be different on uh, the American power supplies. But on the European white power bricks, every one that I have, except a really, really old one that had this, yeah, more grayish, more dark gray cable than the others. That was connected to 5, otherwise all of them are connected to 4. And as usual, the AC is on pin 6 and 7. And there is really not much more to say to this, other than this is a contact with really small surfaces for the, the contacts to make contact. You only have these small forks on each side, down here in the power connector, where um, you will see that the contact is made. And that means that if you get some trouble, or you should at least occasionally, or if it's long since you since use your C64, use some deoxidation things or take the power plug and connect it disconnected for maybe 20 times to rub some of the oxidation of the surface. And also, this is clearly wrong. There is no ground on this one and no ground on this one. And as I said, this 4 is 5 volt or not connected. And um, 9 volt AC is always on 6 and 7. Yes, and now we are into the internals of the C64. And it's not that complicated. The first of this is what you saw Earlier, it's this filtering that is done by uh, Drossel. Yeah, it's in the form of a small transformer, but it doesn't really transform. It's only to suppress noise. And this is what you see here. And this is more accurate for most of them. Both the 9 volt AC lines are taken through this, but only one of the other lines is taken to this um, inductor here. And the switch is only switching the hot 5 volt, not the ground, and one of the AC lines, and the other AC line is connected to the fuse. And this is the same on almost every C64, or on every C64 that I've seen. This circuit, however, varies a bit. But all the old bread bin C64 without the, um, the short board does have two kinds of internal power regulators. And one is a 7805, that creates an additional circuit for 5 volt, and this is marked the CAN 5 volt, and it goes to the video circuit. This is the 7812, it makes 12 volt, and this only goes to the SID chip on the old ones, and to some video amplifier or video mixer circuit, and, and of course the VIC-2 chip itself. And we do have an, another additional use for the AC, and that is what is going on down here. And it's stated here that this is 60 Hz, of course in Norway and most European countries this is 50 Hz. And this goes to the time of day clock on the 6526. And there is not much that uses this clock, but when you have 50 Hz, you do have to set an internal counter register for this clock not to get anything wrong. This is the clock. Yeah, when you, you use the diag cartridge on the C64, you have two timers that goes into the, into the mix, and these are the timers that goes on the bottom of the test, and this is the time of day timers, and they go to both 6526s. It's just connected through here and into here. And also, of course, you have these uh, connections here where the 9 volt AC goes to the um, user port, where they are used for modems and other stuff. I do know some uh, modems and RS-232 interfaces that uses this AC to make minus 12 and plus 12 volt or minus 5 volt. Otherwise, they are not used for much. But there is one other use for hovering from this AC voltage in the C64 and I will show you that uh, afterwards. This is going to power everything else on the C64 that is 5 volt, and everything on the C64 except the SID chip, the video circuitry, and these other things that is requiring special voltages is run off the 5 volt that comes straight into the power supply from the power brick. Yeah, yeah, and I know 
In this uh, sentence, I forgot about the cassette motor interface, but that will come in a short bit. The CAN plus 5 volt on the old models of the C64, this is split into two other circuits and the power is going in this way. And they do some additional filtering to get rid of noise, video frequencies and other stuff that is present on yeah almost every part of the c64 it's to suppress some of this noise and this goes to the video mixer circuit and this one here does follow a similar trend but it's a bit different in that it also has a ferret bead here to suppress additional noise and this is vc and it goes to the video clock for the clock circuit that drives the CPU and the other clocks, um, color clocks and stuff around the, uh, the CPU. On the newer boards, this is greatly simplified, but there are some leftover of this on every C64 until you come to the short boards. And here you can see what I was talking about with the video mixing circuit. This is the old one. And you can see here that you do have only 5 volt to the modulator, but you do have this VVID here to drive the video mixing circuit. And you do have the same here. This is going to VVID. And you have the 5 volts up here to run the VIC chip. And down here you see you have the, the SID chip and this is run by 5 volt and 12 volt both to supply the VDD and also for the emitter follower transistor that is uh, buffering the output. It's also driven off 12 volt and it's also supplied plus 5 volt for VCC for the logical levels. And here is an important notice also regarding power supply and that is the VIC and SID should have separate G and D returns and of course that is not entirely possible on a C64 but they should be connected to one common source not direct to each other. And here you can see they have unregulated 9 volt just rectified and filtered that is feeding the RF modulator and everything of these here is connected um, or is put inside the other kind of RF modulator that is used on the newer versions. And it also have this CAN plus 5 volt and some variation of this it's on every C64 of the old kind. The output circuit for the SID chip is about the same but the newer SID chip will have plus 9 volt here. That is uh, one noticeable difference. But as you can see, this is where the power outputs are, are used. The 12 volt and the plus 5 volt and the CAN voltage all are present around this circuit. And what I was talking about, the VC, that was the clock voltage that also derived from this uh, internal power regulator on the C64, is connected like so. It's used here on every part of the 5 volt power supply inside these cans here and that is to keep the voltage as clean as possible and of course it makes the c64 power supply yeah you do have some more available 5 volt on this because everyone inside here is driven by the internal regulator and the ac line so this is helping the overall 5 volt power supply so you can see here every one of these are powered by this vc so if there are something wrong with the circuit that you did have up here you know that none of the ships in the can should have this 5 volt supply and of course on the modern c64s this is replaced all with just one ic it's the 8701 or 7701 i think it's sometimes powered by this input here or sometimes it's just powered with the plus 5 volt and that is on the short boards and on the short boards things inside are a bit different you can see here they have stated that it's not optional for this power supply, it's connected both to 4 and 5, so a new C64 is no problem with powering with an old power supply. They have stated that this is also filtered, so it's not like in the old ones. And this is probably because they are not making a separate 5 volt for the video circuit, then they need this to be 
less prone to take noise. Otherwise, you can see that the circuit here does not have a ready-made 9 volt or 12 volt regulator as the other C64. It does have here the 9 volt unregulated that is just this rectified and filtered to a 1000 microfarad capacitor. And it's an NPN transistor that can draw some power. And you can see here that they have made it possible to supply the short board with the 6581 SID. Then this diode should be changed with a 12.6 version otherwise it's a 9.6 version of this stone here that is keeping the base voltage stable and you can say that 9.6 volt it will be 9 volt 9.6 here and you do have an additional drop here over the base emitter transition here so this will be 9 volt or 12 volt with a 12.6 so this is much much simplified there is no 7805 and no 7812 or 09 regulator at all and it's also stated here that there is a french version where you do have this r2 this circuit here is probably about the same because this power supply needs to be done anyway but what is done here that you is you connect the 9 volt unregulated voltage to the 5 volt rail here and that means that you actually can draw more power of the 5 volt rail on the French version than on the others. Because over this 20 ohm resistor, you do have about 200 milliamps of current running through this, and that will be drained through the plus 5 volt circuit. So this is a very special circuit, but it do means that in addition to the 1.7 amps that you can draw this, there will be another 200 milliamps going into this. And C63 here is stated to 2200 microfarad, and that means that this one will be bigger, and that will also keep the ripple down and make for this extra power draw that is permanent to feed into the 5 volt. So you can see here this current and this current will actually be added in this junction. It's a very special way of doing things. I've never seen anything like this before. The cassette port is also run by the unregulated 9 volt and that is the same on every C64 but there is some different yeah different ways of doing this and on the short board they have used two transistors and a bit simpler circuit where they have a um, darlington coupled transistor down here that is supplying the motor uh, it doesn't matter much in any way because this transistor here that is actually feeding this is probably able to take all this current anyway so there is really no good explanation why they didn't do this in the first place maybe they didn't find the right transistor or it was very expensive so they had to do this otherwise the circuits are yeah very much the same but this one have some more ferret beads and stuff than on the new boards and ferret beads are to suppress noise and of course when you do have these kind of open connectors and stuff it's very good to have these ferret beads that can take away some of the transition noise on a line like this if you don't understand by now what I mean with the can, this is inside the insulator can, but I do think we understand this by now. So when I say the can voltage is this one inside here. And this is a block diagram of a C64 power supply from the SAMS Commodore 64 troubleshooting and repair guide. And of course we could only have used this and explained everything in great detail because it's, it's actually quite good. You do have the circuit here for the time of day clock. You do have the 9 volt unregulated, you have the 5 volt and you have the no, 12 volt and you have the 5 volt and you have the user port VAC. But by doing it my way I have also described where each of these voltages are going. Of course this was the CAN voltage and this is the logic. And just to see things in the big uh, picture here up you have the tape drive here you have the big oscillator circuit before this was put inside the um, 8701 chip and here you have the, of course this one should also be inside there this one is the regular power input and 12 volt and 5 volt regulation this is the power diode and this is the time of day circuit to make logic level out of this so 
it's just to see where things fit in on the schematics and of course on this one you do have the circuit here for the um, oscillator for the modulator i mean for the video signal and stuff this was the oscillator or clock circuit for the video dot clock and so on and also the cpu frequencies but to get further we need to speak about this thing and this is my c64 power brick tester and it's mainly meant for testing over voltage and i do have the 5 volt circuit going into this and it's measuring how well the 12 uh, 5 volt line is working and this is connected via this rectifier up here and some other stuff this uh, variable resistor here and this should give an indication of the ac voltage but i have not been able to look into this much but this is not measuring very good but at least i can see some indication of how this goes and here is the test circuit this is testing the ac and the dc with adding a lot of resistors and all of these are in parallel so this should be able to take more power and this one turns on and off the test and if i have the test off this is passed through to a c64 so i can be able to power my c64 and of course this takes the power lead in here and i do have this other power outlet so this i'm going to modify so that i am able to put some amper meters and another voltmeter for the ac at least and maybe a better voltmeter for the dc and this thing was built in this uh, video here it was yeah a prelude i think to my ninth video in the c64 resurrection series and this is how we are going to measure stuff we are going to measure the 5 volt rail we are going to measure the ac rail that we have available down here and i'm going to measure the current that goes into this so i do have to break the circuit some way here to connect the ac and dc amper meters so how this will be connected i really don't remember because i don't remember much about this construction i remember vaguely what it does but that's it and the reason why we are doing this is that i really need to know how much power does a c64 draw and what actually should a good power supply for the c64 actually deliver so i'm going to measure how much current is actually going into a c64 the different models how much is wasted in the power supply and how much is actually being delivered to the c64 and what do we really know about this yeah we do have some information here this is quite common for all the old foot warmer bricks one amp of uh, 9 volt and 1.5 amps of 5 volt and also the old power bricks are stated that they have 33 volt amps and that is the total power consumption and they say that they use 220 volt in and this is the same this is another brick a whiter one and this is some other i'm not really sure but this is also from one of these uh, transformers but you can see this one is actually 240 volt and this is a foot warmer bridge and this one also is the same it's 220 volt and 220 volt but these are the newer models that have 1.7 amp on the output and what you also can notice is that these newer ones they actually just list the the volt amps that is going out from the circuit while these ones are taking into account also what's wasted inside the brick itself and this is also a more modern brick with 240 volt power supply so this might be a german model i'm not sure i do seem to remember that some regions in german have 240 volt so what do we know most european units have 220 volt input and that is true we have some deviations with 240 and of course all the american ones are 170 17 volt as markings and i do saw someone with 111 but i do think that is a typo of some kind and we also know that the newer bricks from the for the american market also has a higher dc rating on 8.5 volts or 1.7 amps output while this one kept to the same as the old european versions with 1.5 for the 5 volt so older units have 1.5 amps 5 
5 volt, newer have 1.7 amp output capacity. New units are rated for 18 volt output, but older units are rated for 33 volt amps total consumption. And that some units are 240 volt. But here I see that the fuse here is rated for 250 milliamps, and the fuses up here is for 200 milliamps. So I do fear that I have used the same transformer and that it's delivering slightly higher voltage on the output but I don't have these in my stock so I can't really tell I don't have any of these for for measuring on yeah the US adapters I spoke about and all are rated for one amp on the nine volt AC winding yeah or rather nine volt amps that and this is how these are coupled and I've seen both versions this one here have a single winding for supplying the five volt output and this more common one has two windings and only two diodes and um, coupled together ground here to supply two way rectifier so these are quite similar in specs but this one actually relies on three nine volt windings while this is two different nine volt windings to get this output they have the same 4700 microfarad filter cap and there are a lot and lot and different schematics where these resistor values actually differ somewhat. And the same with the American ones, it's the same capacitor and they have this kind of schematic here where they use two windings and have this one connected to ground. Otherwise there are some differences in placement of fuses and stuff. But, but we know more than this. And here is what is stated on every C64 made that I have been able to spot at least. Everyone of them say that they together on the 5 volt rail on the 9 volt rail they pull 15 watts and of course the maximum that we could take out here was 18 or or something like so so it's stated that we draw a lot but of course we don't because the c64 g and the original c64 and the c64 c have different power draw because when you put less ram ships you have less ships in the oscillator circuit and so on of course they will draw less power so there are some differences and the newer c64 c's that have the most ships that in in the 85 series they are drawing only a tenth of the power of the 65 kind of of circuits so there are differences there are huge differences and they're not stated everywhere everyone says that this uses 15 watts and when I say that the transformer on the old one was rated 35, you do have that the C64's transformers in the US, they are rated for 40 watts. And that is the total power consumption when you are loading every circuit. And you also have an efficiency factor on the transformer. And a normal transformer that is driven with a nominal load, I used to say that this is no more than 85 to 90 percent accurate and, and this is by no means what is for this transformer this is an elementary general circuit that I mostly draw from uh, from memory and of course if you connect some cartridges you maybe have some other boards and modems and you have your Raspberry Pi connected with the P1541 and stuff of course it will draw more power but that is a different story you do need some additional power in most cases, but the input on the C64 is not able to handle much more than what it's getting. And there are a huge variant of C64 power supplies, even though they look almost the same, there are some differences. And every one of the foot warmers that I have, or not every one of them, some are the same, but most of them have some difference is the placement of the fuse holder is the kind of cables it's some of the engravings it's the placement of the grills for the ventilation the yeah the fuse holder the writing the legs the, there are lots and lots of different versions of this and the same with the white newer power brick there are at least two versions and some of the difference is because i maybe have collected them from other countries and there are some slight differences how these should be fused from one country to another in norway it's enough with one fuse on the primary side the 230 volt side and this fuse should be rated so that it will blow if there is a short circuit on the inside 
But the mains voltage has increased from 220 to 230 volt and even 240 in some countries. And this is the optimal value and it can vary between 207 and 253 volt in Norway because this is rated with a 10% accuracy. Yeah, most peoples and most homes have about 220 to 240, 45 volts. But you can see here that when this was 9 volt back in the day, it's 9.4 with the nominal voltage and you do you have 250 it's 10.2 volt and this is additional voltage that has to be dissipated inside the transformer so the transformer will get warmer and the 9 volt ac that is supplied to the c64 will also be higher and that means that internal in your c64 it will also be warmer this is because the ratings between the windings in the transformer is set so when this was made you do have a 24.4 factor difference between these voltages and that is just the way it is it's no good to try to change that so you do have more power dissipation than you had before and we will stop there with the theory for today at least for now and we need to get some good answers on stuff before we continue on in this series and we need to start measuring so the rest of this video i will prepare for measuring and hopefully i will start measuring something and see where we got from there so the first order of the day is to modify the c64 psu tester to be able to measure current in circuit yeah and i do have to collect some multimeters and maybe to make some test cables and I set up a test rig and so on and i will yeah use some different power supplies so now it's over to the bench and see what we can do there yeah this here is my power supply tester and uh, yeah it's supposed to go this way and i do remember making this i do remember basically how it works but I've done some strange things to this and I do remember that I was not able to get the ampere meter no the, the voltmeter for the AC to be very accurate I just used a, a rectifying bridge and a small capacitor to measure this and it's a bit inaccurate and I've not looked into that and I do have this I have soldered a wire here and I don't remember how it was. Is this the resistors for the 5 volt or is this the resistors for the 5 volts? I'm not totally sure, but I will find out. And this basically, yeah, it, it basically works by switching in a load, and, and the load I have is a lot and lot of resistors that is piggybacked to each other and stand as a, a parallel load. To make it um, stand up for for more power dissipation and this is a relay that switches in these loads and otherwise the signals will go straight to the c64 or the load will be connected like so and as the power switch on the c64 this works by switching in just the ac or dc and the switching is done by the dc power so if the power supply does not have working 5 volt DC, then this relay and stuff will not work either. And I do have some diodes here. But what I really need to do is I have to break one line AC and one line DC and put in the ampere meter in between. And the voltmeter I'm just going to connect here for the AC and... I think it was down here for the DC, that is 5 volt. Yeah, I think I just will connect this to my um, C64 power supply and see how this goes. On the um, bench here, I have my, my blue one. I do have these in all kinds of colors, because when I have more than one power supply on my bench, I need to, to be able to see which one I connect on this connect and I have a green one here and you can also see it's green on the top here and I also have a red one and a yellow one and if I just connect this like so oh I, I, um, I misspoke this is for the, um, the 5 volt rail 
and this is for the AC rail and you can see I had the load switched in this uh, diode here lights up when I do that and this is quite the heavy load but I don't remember how much and this power supply that I have on my bench the blue one it is not the most sturdy one because I do think that this only has a 1.5 um, a switch mode regulator inside but um, what are the voltages here I have to find some meters to um, to measure out this and I can check here this is what I thought was the the 5 volt rail yeah 5068 and that is very close to 507 and this is measuring 11.6 and that is probably the rectified oh it's 14 point something yeah it's better maybe than uh, that I just connect the scope to this and measure the voltages by the scope and I can use this one and one other multimeter to measure the, the currents this has AC current down here so I think that will that will be okay and for DC current I will just grab one of my other meters and check that the battery is okay but first I have to modify this the voltages as I said they're quite easy the um, power that needs some thinking I, I have to break the lines between this plug here or actually it's better if I just connect them straight as close to this one as possible then I can measure the current only with the tester also yeah so next line of business disconnect the power here and attach it back with some some jumpers A jumper will be fine I think I should have had some yeah maybe a plug with something more powerful than a jumper on the AC it won't be a problem one amp is not that much but if I'm going to use about two amps on the 5 volt I might need something sturdier than just a, a pin header I will uh, check but as I have no documentation whatsoever I need to figure this out and this is the AC line that's for sure and since these two are coupled together the 4 and 5 pin for the power supply I do think that that is 5 volt and this one here is ground so I either break this one and put a jumper yeah that's the easiest thing to do and I can also put a jumper here for the AC line yeah that is what I'm going to do so there I have a, a connection that is broken from here to here hopefully but if I place a jumper here they will be connected and I can also put some measuring leads here to um, to measure the power and this is the 5 volt and I will do likewise to measure the AC and where will I put that one I don't have a lot of space here but I do have some I could place it on this one on the outside I do have to change this yellow wire here that yellow was the main connection here and then this one will just be a short bridge over here so now I have put one in between here and one over there and I can of course what, what I've done here is I made the lead thicker but this is the 5 volt rail and I do think that is important to keep as uh, as fat as possible but the AC rail I don't think I will get much yeah power drop on this short piece here but we just have to um, to see what we get when we start measuring and what more uh, yes um, I will take some measurement pins and here yeah, for the voltage too so that I can just use uh, four millimeter banana connectors and connect everything together when I, I start measuring 
Yes, today we are going to continue on what we started earlier with the C64 and we have done the modifications on this. I will go through them in detail in a bit. I need to clear some of the, the space here to be able to um, fit a C64. I don't need it in the picture, but we are going to do some measurements on a C64. And first I take this one. This is a fully tested uh, C64 that I actually already have promised the guy that I will give away to him. And I will test this with a cartridge and another doohickey and the bare computer itself. And as you can see, this is a short board. Yeah, you, you can't see it, but you really can, because the um, Commodore keyboards with the print of the graphic characters on the top is almost always a short board. And you can also verify it by looking inside to see the placement of the RF modulator and the other stuff inside here, and uh, the shield. So, yeah, this is a short board for sure, and this is also a made in Hong Kong computer. That I have featured in some of my other videos. And in this setup here, I'm feeding the power from my uh, C64 power supply into this one. And here I have breakouts here for the AC current, the DC current, the AC voltage and the DC voltage. And even though I have multimeters here, this one and this one, that is capable of doing more than one channel, that is no go here, because you can't isolate the channels, they have common ground on both this one and this one. So the setup here is as follows. I will measure the AC current on the AC circuit on this one. I will measure the AC voltage here on this one. This one will measure the DC current on the 5 volt and this will measure the 5 volt DC. And then I have two other doohickeys. I do have this one that I got some time ago that is a clamp multimeter, ampere meter. I'm going to hook this to the 220 volt on the AC transformer. And I also have this one that I actually got some time ago and this is a meter that is should monitoring a current from your outlet so I'm actually going to use both of these to see if they measure about the same so a lot of measurements and why do I do all of this yeah because the only indication I have for the power use of the C64 is this one that you have 5 volt and 9 volt and 15 watts so no one can tell me exactly what the C64 of the different motherboard versions actually are drawing. So that is something I need to find out. I can't tell you for certain anything about the Commodore power supply, if it's underrated, overrated, whatever, if I don't need uh, know the current drum that is actually going into these computers. So that is the science we are going to look into. Yeah, like so. And you probably won't be able to see all this. I'm going to take a readout and write it down. This tangle of wires and unreadable readouts for you guys is my measurement setup. And I do have this amper meter here that is measuring input to the um, Commodore 64 foot warmer power brick and this is a modified one and I do have this watt meter that is measuring 4 watts of input and this is before I have turned on the C64 but I do have some internal power consumption here you know because I don't have the resistors coupled in of course but this rectifier and the LEDs from these meters is drawing a small amount of, uh, of current. And my static measurements before I turn on the C64 is that I have 4.99 volts on this one. I have zero on the reading on the ampere meter inside. I have four watts on this energy monitor meter. I have about 100 milliamps on the AC, but it's um, varying a bit. And I do have 
as I can see I do have yeah zero amps it sees but this is on AC of course it this should be DC like so and amps so this should be right and I'm now going to turn on my C64 and I am reading here now that I'm drawing 785 milliamps the voltage has dropped a bit I do think it's because I do have uh, a lot of these uh, power consumption and amp meters in between but we do have some readings that I can use and this is probably a bit too low to run the C64 but we will run with this what we have the amp meter is running the, the watt meter is running 9 or 10 watt we don't have any additional draw on the AC voltage yet just uh, yes 2 or 3 milliamps we do have 10 volt AC yeah 780 milliamps on the DC and yeah we are measuring about 4.36 volt so that is a bit low on the output on the C64 I will turn this um, off again and I do have to supply more 5 volt, so I do have to see what I can do with that to make this a bit more accurate because I really want to have these ampere meters connected in between here so I must see what I can do to yeah, not be so invasive in the measurements probably the best way to put it turn on the c64 again and compare the measurement results yeah they are about the same i will try to feed this one through my um, my bench power supply just to measure with the right currents and, and stuff here so i will have to yeah abandon what i'm going to measure on the power brick for now and just measure the ac from the power brick and the DC I have to take from my bench meter and I probably just can supply this in here and break this circuit as this is the way we are measuring things now so I will try to explain what I'm doing here yeah my current setup here it might look a bit untidy but this is the same as before it's measuring into the power brick but instead of feeding the 5 volt to my lob power brick I'm going to use my lab power supply to be able to raise the voltage on the output and now before I turn on the C64 it's 5.07 I'm measuring on this and of course it's not drawing any current currently so play your words and now I turn on the C64 and it drops to 3.9 it's still a lot of drop on the uh, amp meter so I do have to compensate the um, AC voltage is still 10.2 4.4 volt yeah 4.99 volt so this is 5 volt on RC64 it's drawing 800 milliamps on the um, DC rail so 800 milliamps is what we are getting into there and the DC the AC amp I do have to make a better reading of this yeah, and this is um, yeah a short overview of what I, I had to do. I couldn't get the measurement right with all the inline amper meters, so I did have to use this clamp amper meter instead. And the reason for that is that every amper meter that is done without a clamp or induction, they use a shunt resistor or a piece of wire or anything that makes a voltage drop. And when I was measuring into my multimeters, I get this all the way from 1 ohm to 12 ohms. And even with 1 ohm and um, a current of 1 amp, you do have 1 voltage of, of drop. So uh, this is no good. I did have to make uh, other arrangement. And even though I could have measured with this one and factor it in, it was just too much work to, yeah, to do all the couplings because I only had one amper meter with this low resistance all the other ones was in this area here so no good and i could have used them in the 10 amp 10 amp area then the resistance was lower but then the accuracy was too bad to bet get good measurements so i settled with this clamp amper meter 
and I just measured the voltages and I moved the clamp around and switched it from AC to DC and measured the current on the input, on the output and so on. And in my measurements here I have not measured the power loss inside the power brick, it's only on the outside and the regulator circuits there that is taken into account. And we are still doing all these measurements here. Uh, we did measure our um, inlet to be 238 volt, and that is the same, only 237.9 was the actual. Uh, and I tested this both with my scope meter and with the other fluke. I measured this with the three components that you can see here attached. I tested with the tape player attached, the cartridge attached and this RS-232 adapter to get also some power draw on the 9 volt uh, AC. And together this will make a good picture of a standard load on a C64. And I also measured this with the play a button pressed so the motor on the data set was running and i did this with only two different c64s because this took a lot of time it was very time consuming and i did have to make the measurements several times to make them comparable so in the end i ended up with measuring on one short board and one 407 board old bread bin and the measurements is on is with bare computer then it's just this plugged in and a picture on the screen or I measured with all these devices plugged in so and that call that full load and what we do see here is that I adjusted my power supply so that I had 5.7 uh, 07 volts into the C64 and that means that I can compensate with about 0 0.7 volts for the rest of the voltage drop uh, to the cable to I get inside the C64. The AC voltage was quite constant on 10.54 volt. I'm not sure if that is totally accurate, but there was almost no draw on the AC voltage. And I measured that it was 820 milliamps, 5 volt. 21, uh, 210 milliamps of AC amps and when full load, when I had all the things together, it reached almost 1 amp on the short board and 0 0.33 on the AC voltage. And as we discussed earlier, there is a huge difference on the short boards of what they do with additional voltages that is derived from the um, AC voltage and not just drawn from the DC amp from the power supply. All the video circuits and stuff that has used the internal 7805 is now supplied through this one. And this is values that I have just have calculated based on the DC and um, AC currents and voltages. And the total load on the bare computer is about 6.4 watts and 8.5 watts for a fully loaded C64 shortboard. And the same inputs, of course, as the shortboard, but you can see the AC voltage dropped somewhat. And what we can see here is that the DC amper is about 1, point, or 1 amp with a bare computer. So that is um, uh, 180 milliamps more just from the 5. And with a fully loaded computer, it's about 110 milliamps more on the DC 5 volt from the power supply. And on the AC voltage, I was drawing, when I was drawing here, I had 210 milliamps. Here it's 870 milliamps on the AC line. And with a fully loaded computer, it reached 1 amp on the um, AC line. And if you do remember, on one of the power supplies that um, I saw on the 128 DCR, this was only 300 milliamps that was supplied of 9 volt AC. With um, uh, it, it had a 300 milliamp fuse. And here you can see the really big difference. You almost load this with 14.29 with a bare computer, and that is the 15 watts that we have on the bottom of the original bread bin, and with uh, fully loaded you are about 16 watts and that is a fully loaded power brick 
And that is why these old power bricks get so warm. But then you can say that, okay, the newer Commodore 64s, they did have a new power supply for the, for the short boards. But I can't understand why they didn't reduce the size of the additional 9 volt AC transformer. And I can't really say why they actually did this, uh, this upgrade, because if it's only drawing one amp on a fully loaded machine, why should they upgrade this from 1.5 to 1.7? I don't know, it makes no, no good sense. But one thing is for sure, on a short board, every C64 power supply is well within specification and they should last a very, very long time. But on the bread bins, that's a totally different story. This is almost loaded with a full load all the time. And that is no way for a power supply to work. So the heat alone would suffice that this won't last forever. But the white bricks, it has to be component failure if they are failing because they are not overloaded. But of course you, you do have another way of overloading your uh, C64 and this is a little side note about power and expansion. And if you put in one of these this is the RU, the, the RAM expansion, and there was a, a 64 version that was called the 1764. And this actually has eight uh, 41256 chips. And you can see here that these chips, each one of them, have about 400 milliwatts of power consumption, and they was drawing 25 milliwatts in standby. So you do have to take into account eight times 0 0.400 watts as uh, an additional load when you was connecting this and Commodore was aware of this so when you bought this for the C64 for the 128 this was accounted for but on the C64 they was bundling this with a new power supply where you can draw 2.5 amps on the 5 volt and the same 1 amp on the 9 volt so there is this other power supply too the part number here I should very much like to get my hand on one of those to see what's inside. But it do look kind of a um, mix between 128 and the newer C64C power supply. But I never seen one in real life. But I do have a 1750 RAM expansion. So when I am sure that my power supply will handle this, I will plug in this and test. And this could be a final test when we have yeah, made and modified the power supply so that it will work like this. Yes, that was uh, rather long and windy. But as I said, I do have to go into some detail to really explain what's going on inside the C64. And we have already uncovered some things that is widely undercommunicated, and that is the short boards need a much less power, they get less warm than an older bread bin. And one other thing that is kind of controversial is that you really don't need the AC voltage at all. Of course you need to feed something to these terminals, but it could be DC voltage. The only thing that actually requires AC voltage inside a C64 is two things. It's the voltage doubler that already feeds the 7812 that's inside an old bread bin. And you need it to feed the time of day clock that is rarely not used. It can be used, but I've not seen many things that actually use it. And I even tested some years ago by using the 8520, I think the name is. Uh, it's the uh, CAA ships that is made for the Amiga. They are the same as the, um, the 26s that's in the uh, C64, but they don't have the time of day clock. And they work just fine. I have used one in my C64s for, for many years, and it's... I've not really seen anything that does not work except for the the clock is doesn't count if you use the diagnosis on it. So you can feed a C64 and a short board where you only have 9 volt inside and you do have this serial regulator. It probably will be fine just by powering it with 10.5 volt DC to this line and this is something we actually are going to test but this episode far too long and 
I have got a lot of requests about modifying and making new power supplies, and I'm a bit drawn on what I do. This is the easiest ones to modify. They are far easier than the white uh, power bricks. The white power bricks here are more filled to the brim with um, epoxy and stuff. These are quite easy to hack out the front end here to get something inside. And I also could go this way. This is um, a failed print actually of a um, C64 power brick that is taken from Thingiverse. I actually, this is a failed one. I printed this with supports and it's not easy to get the supports out. So I don't think I ever will use that one. And it also failed on the top here where the printer actually got stuck in some lights. So we have several routes to go. I have not decided yet, but we will look into modifying one of these. I do have one of my modified one. Oh, this actually has a name underneath. It's Nils Remi Eilertsen. If you are watching this, just call me and you can get your power supply back in reconditioned order. Uh, the next episode will be in a couple of weeks, I think. It was a lot and lots of work making this episode. And I do think the next one will be just as challenging because then we are starting to look into power supplies, serial regulators, inside loss of transformers, and what you can expect to get out from one of these. And we are also going to take a yeah, bit of a deep dive into how you can make your own power supply and how that should be. If everything is one episode, okay, but we might have two more. So hope you enjoyed the contents. Please leave uh, some comments below. Please uh, share the contents. And until next time, have a good one.